So welcome, everybody. I'm excited to see a packed house for this uh, important topic. And uh, I think most of you know this, but the ASP Institute does a lot of things in addition to putting on awesome <laughs> convenings that bring people together for change-making conversations. We run programs on a wide range of topics in parts uh, of the country and the world where people have never been to Aspen, Colorado, but they sure know what the Aspen Institute is. And many of those communities are rural, rural U.S., uh, all around the world. We identify leaders. We work to frame issues in ways that can help lead to solutions. We've gathered people up for forms of convening that are locally organized about local issues. And this is a chance for us to put a spotlight on three leaders who are really getting the job done on critical questions of health in rural communities. I want to just frame the topic for a second, and then we'll get right into the questions. So in thinly populated regions that stretch over vast territories, primary care is often a long journey from home, and specialty services are often completely out of reach. Access to care in some more isolated communities may be further complicated by cultural or language barriers, limited transportation networks, and poverty. But advocates are working in the rural space, taking, talking about solutions, not problems. Local empowerment, communication technology, hub and spoke models that link primary care providers to specialists, and greater resource commitments are among the strategies bringing more care to historically underserved communities. And they're doing it in partnership with communities, not from the top alone, but in a relationship. Um, and so on that note, we have three leaders working in diverse ways. And I, rather than getting them to come across and say too much about the organizations, I want to get us into the human side of these issues right away. So my first question, not a trick question, is tell your name, say, and then tell a story that for you really helps you um, convey the importance of the work you do and the people that you serve. Uh, and so we'll start uh, with Don Warren. Well, thank you so much. My name is uh, Dr. Donald Warren. I currently serve as the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. I'm also director of what's called the Indians into Medicine or InMed program, and also director of the Master of Public Health program. And in terms of why I, I got into this work, it starts back when I was actually in college. I'm originally from a very small rural town called Kyle, South Dakota. And I was like to ask, how many people have been to Kyle, South Dakota? <laughs> one. <laughs> That's one more than usual, actually, so it's very impressive. <laughs> Uh, it's a very small community on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. But when I was in grade school, we moved to Arizona. So I actually spent most of my childhood in the Phoenix area. And uh, as I was going through college, my grandmother was getting older. And she was uh, more frail. And uh, she decided to move to Phoenix to live with us. And unfortunately, she had been a lifelong smoker. And uh, she was a full-time mother, full-time grandmother, had 10 children of her own. I don't even know exactly how many grandchildren she had at that time. But in the 1980s, she moved to Phoenix to live with us. And she developed a cough that wouldn't go away. So we took her to Phoenix Indian Medical Center, and they did a chest x-ray. And it was clear that she had lung cancer. But because of the rules within Indian Health Service, she was not eligible for a referral to an oncologist from Phoenix Indian Medical Center. She also had not done her 40 quarters of work to be eligible for Social Security. She was not enrolled in Medicare. Uh, she could have qualified for Medicaid, but we couldn't prove how long she lived in Phoenix. We didn't put the light bill in her name when she moved to live with us. So the only way we could get her a referral is we had to take her back to South Dakota. And in that process, there was wait times to even get her in to see a doctor, wait times to get a referral. She wound up dying in an emergency room with lung cancer with never seeing an oncologist. And that could still happen today. So my interest in medicine started with wanting to be a primary care doctor, but it's evolved into recognizing that we have bad policy in this country, and some populations are affected more adversely than others. And that's it, not a happy story, but that's why I got into yeah. this work. Don, thank you so much for, for starting us off with that kind of a personal story. Um, well, Sanjeev? Yeah, my name is Sanjeev Arora, and I serve as the director of the ECHO project all over the world. And, uh, you know, this is a project 
to democratize knowledge, to get best practices to underserve people all over the world. Our goal is to help a billion people by 2025. But the story, in 2001, you know, I'm a gastroenterologist by profession. I'm a specialist in a disease called hepatitis C, which affects 70 million people worldwide. Only 5% have received treatment. But in 2001, on a Friday afternoon, I walked into a patient in my clinic, my hepatitis C clinic. And there was a 43-year-old woman sitting there. But what was different was there were two children in the room, too. There was a 14-year-old boy sitting with her, a 9-year-old girl. And I asked her, how can I help you? And she said, I, you know, I have hepatitis C, and I want treatment. So I said, terrific. That's what we do in this clinic. And uh, how long have you had it? And she said, you know, I probably had it a long time. When I was 18, I experimented with drugs with my friends. But I didn't like them. But um, now, eight years ago, I was told I have hepatitis C. And um, so I said, why is it that you, you're coming today as opposed to when they told you eight years ago? And she said, you know, I live four and a half, five hours away. I live in Albuquerque, and she lived in a rural part of New Mexico. And I had called your clinic because my primary doctor asked me to come and see you. And they said that, first of all, I would have to wait eight months. There was an eight-month wait to see me. And I would have to make 12 trips to see you, five hours each way, by car. <clears throat> and you know, I don't make that much money. And I would have to pull my kids out of school. I'm a single mother. And my car is unreliable. And there's no way I could do that. I was feeling very tired, but I, I thought, you know, I'm just going to crank it out. So she kept working. She didn't come. So I asked her, why did you come today? And she said, now I'm having pain here in my abdomen. And when I work, it hurts a lot more. So I, I do an ultrasound, typically, when I get a patient like this. And I did an ultrasound. And she had a cancer in her liver this big. So hepatitis C, people die from this disease, from liver cancer and cirrhosis. And now she was willing to come as many times as I wanted her to. But it was too late. It was too big to get a liver transplant. She already had cirrhosis. We couldn't cut it out because there wasn't enough residual good liver there. And she passed away, leaving these two children. I asked myself, look, I'm living in the richest country in the world. In the rural area, the treatment was available. The diagnostic tests were available. What happened here? What really happened was that the right knowledge didn't exist in the right place at the right time. Yeah. You can have unlimited resources, but if the right knowledge doesn't exist there, it will lead to massive inequity. And that's what happened here. And then I designed Project ECHO in 2003 to solve this problem in every underserved part of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Now, Michelle, you work in Guatemala. Yeah. Um, and I'm, in a moment, I'm going to have you share with the audience your association with the ASPA Institute. It's so wonderful yeah. to be able to meet you yeah. and interview you. Um, but can you tell a story that motivates your work? So I'm the medical director of WINGS. Um, um, it's an NGO uh, in Guatemala. And we provide contraception to half of the country. We travel throughout the country with mobile units. So I want to say two short stories. The first of all, uh, when I entered the in, in WINGS, um, I told everybody we have to start uh, doing vasectomies. And everybody told me I was crazy because men in Guatemala will not accept vasectomies. Well, let's try. Uh, I told them, let's try. Uh, I'm, uh, one week after we start doing uh, promotion for the vasectomy clinics, we had 80 men in, in, in our list. So we had it to do a lot of clinics to, to serve these 80 men. And we went uh, to a very difficult area, Momostenango. It's maybe 10 hours from the city. Um, and I told them, nah, we're not going to have any men there because uh, it's a very indigenous uh, population. Um, and they're very uh, based on myths, so they're not going to accept us. And we had eight men. One of them told me, I've been waiting for this for years. Because my, my, my wife has already eight children, and she's suffering enough. It's my time to suffer. So oh. that was. Mm. Uh, and because I'm a woman, I have to tell you a story of a woman. 
uh, I did that surgery, tubal ligation, uh, and she, uh, after the surgery, she started crying and crying a lot. So I thought, oh my God, I did something wrong. Maybe she didn't want it to, to have a surgery. Uh, and she told me, I'm bipolar and I don't want kids because I know my kids can have the same disease. Uh, and I went to eight places to have a surgery and nobody wanted to do it because I don't have kids. So thank you very much. And she started crying and that was, so we, we really focus on serve, on serve population, uh, people that nobody wants to treat, people uh, who are, doesn't have any other possibilities. So, so just, just amazing, these, these stories. A grandmother, a mother, um, women and men in Guatemala who others thought wouldn't want the services you could offer. Um, there's so much eminence in the need of all of the individuals you've spoken about. Um, let's talk for a moment, and quickly, but about the kinds of issues that we should be thinking about when we think about this question of rural or remote populations. So one is that government programs often are designed in a way that keep people out mm -hmm. of access to service. And one may be that there are cultural myths, mm -hmm. expectations that aren't actually accurate about what people want. OK, so what else? You know, you know from my perspective, this is truly an issue of equity. And the inequity in healthcare can be driven by many, many considerations. Yeah. Rurality is one of them. We would call that the distance barrier. But there could be an economic barrier for inequity. There could be a linguistic barrier for inequity. You speak a certain language and you, there could be a cultural barrier for inequity because we are not taking care of the cultural needs of a native community and we want to apply our own. Uh, there could be racial barriers of inequity. There could be gender barriers. One of the greatest gender, gender inequity occurs in a country like India, for example, where the man will be able to travel 200 miles to get treatment, but a woman is not allowed to travel alone unless her husband takes time off work. So therefore, there can be gender inequity. There are so many reasons that we find for inequity which can be overcome if the right knowledge and the right care is provided at the right place where they live, yeah. rather than making them move into an area which they can be shocked by any one of these. Uh, they could be gay and people don't have a religious barrier and all kinds of things like that. So taking care to where they are yeah. is, the, is, is a way to overcome some of those problems. And we'll get a chance to hear about the model of ECHO, which, which addresses exactly that. Um, Don, any barriers that, or factors that we should also have on the table in addition? Well, certainly coming from an American Indian perspective, we have our own unique health system that's largely not addressed and, and not discussed. So I appreciate being a part of this discussion because quite often we're not even at the table or, or on the stage, so to speak, when, when the issues are, arise regarding less access and certainly issues related to equity. But we have a lot of the, the issues that rural and frontier populations have just in terms of access. And it's not just access to medical care or specialty care, it's even access to local supermarkets. So uh, it is a food desert where I am from, Kyle, South Dakota. The closest supermarket is in Rapid City, which is 90 miles away. So imagine doing a 180 mile round trip every time you wanted to go to the supermarket. And that's if you have good transportation and good weather, which we don't always have when in, in rural impoverished yeah. reservation communities. So it is interesting, and I appreciate your comments. If we could have all of the knowledge in the world, but if we can't translate it into action, what good is it? So we could have diabetes educators, we could talk about nutrition, we could do nutrition counseling, but if people simply don't have access to healthy food, what good is that counseling? What good is that knowledge if we can't actually implement uh, those types of things? So um, certainly, even in the, the medical side, not just specialty care and primary care, we also have problems with opioid addiction, like many rural populations have. And on, I'd say in my region, over 90% of the reservation communities have zero medication-assisted treatment providers, MAT, yeah. which is shown to be effective for opioid 
uh, treatment, but we just simply don't have any providers that are certified. So, so the, the barriers are significant, and it runs the whole gamut of primary prevention and social determinants of health through primary care and specialty care. Thank you. Um, Michelle, something else? Uh, yeah, in, in my experience, I've seen a lot of barriers. First of all, the myths, because uh, a lot of men in Guatemala think that if women is using contraception, it's because she's going to be with other men. Um, they don't have money to travel, or the uh, public sector has not been trained their personal, so they don't know how to insert an IUD, hormonal implants, or those surgeries. So uh, I have to say that the, in my experience, the main barrier has been us, <laughs> the providers, because we have our own bias. Uh, no, 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 lady, this is not good for you. You should continue using Depo for 50 mm. years. So uh, I think it's the most uh, biggest challenge for us. Uh, other thing is that our roads, it's um, very, very hard to travel. Uh, there are short, Guatemala is very, very tiny, but we have a very bad road system. So to travel to Coban, that is maybe 90 um, miles away, it took me one day 12 hours. 90 miles. Yep. So uh, how can you expect a woman to travel that distance uh, to receive something that uh, she's hiding from uh, her husband? So, yep. so I want to uh, pause in the editorial moment. Uh, the Aspen Institute has this superb program that identifies around the world change makers, Michelle and many others, who are making a difference. It's called the New Voices Fellowship. In fact, are there any other New Voices fellows here right now? <laughs> so everybody should be breathing in hope, leadership, inspiration, determination, drive, resilience, courage, uh, and a get it done mentality because it's in the air here. But will you say a little bit about what this fellowship is? Well, you can read more, but I want to say something from my heart. <laughs> Um, it's a one-year program that they train us. Uh, we're leaders in our countries, in Asia, Africa, America, and they train us to do this. Do you think it's easy for me, for a Latin woman, to be with three men, three exceptional men? <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard. Uh, it, it's, it's not easy. So they are teaching us, they are giving us tools uh, to raise our voices and improve um, education and to uh, Tell the world that there's more than only the United States or only Canada or only Europe. There's yeah. a lot more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, on that theme now of getting it done and solutions, can I ask each of you to reflect on the, the work you do? What's the difference <laughs> that your work is making that can give us a sense of the proof of the possible. Yeah. Well, I had mentioned uh, that I'm director of what's called Indians into Medicine, or the InMed program. It's been around since 1973. And at University of North Dakota, we've now graduated over 240 American Indian physicians from the university. So it's the most successful Ooh. indigenous medical training program in history. Wow. Yeah, so our, our thank wow. you. Yeah. Yeah. So our incoming class, starting in August, is the class of 2023, so that's the 50-year anniversary class of the Indians into Medicine program. But we, we don't just look for rising stars that have already taken the MCAT, the medical college admissions test that are doing well in college. We recognize that we have to go much further upstream. So we actually have what's called our InMed Summer Institute, and it's going on right now in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And we have American Indian students from all over the country from grades seven through 12, so middle school and high school. And they spend six weeks with us. And they take courses in math, chemistry, physics, biology, communications, and health. Yeah. And they also get to meet other people, other people in their age group that are living on reservations and wanting to go into the health sciences. And I can speak from experience, it's not easy to be a nerd on the reservation. Yeah. <laughs> There's all kinds of pressures pulling us away from being successful in school. So we try to create cohorts of people who um, have common uh, goals and ideas, uh, but recognize that we have to start very far upstream. Our big challenge has been our, our resources from Indian Health Service have not gone up in 12 years. So we've had flat funding. 
And as costs go up, the numbers of students we engage actually goes down. Yeah. So that's one of our big challenges, trying to get adequate resources. Programs like that are some of the most important ways to create the, the leaders of tomorrow. It's so incredibly valuable for those young people. Now, we can't see them. They're there. They, but if we, if we closed our eyes and we thought about them, mm -hmm. um, is there, what word or two do you think defines them? Right? Resilient is one. Yeah. You had mentioned the word yeah. resilience. And a lot of our kids go through so many challenges with dealing with historical trauma, adverse childhood experiences, immersed in poverty and communities with lots of addiction, lots of violence, but they're still there. They're still doing well in school. They still want to become physicians and nurses and therapists. They're, they're both resilient and incredibly inspiring. So, you know, uh, Aspen Institute has a Center for Native American Youth. It's run out of D.C. by Eric Stegman. It's an awesome program. It's, it's, a, it's a, in brotherhood and sisterhood with your program. And I met this young man named Trenton who was out of school, out of work through that program. And Eric and his team met him and put him in a cohort, just like you're doing, um, although he may have had a winding path to get to that cohort. And there was so much anger when he started. Um, and I was in a setting where Eric asked him, about what changed. And he said, well, I used to think that not voting was an act of rebellion. Now I know it's an act of surrender. Oh. And they had awakened that political wow. vitality, mm -hmm. that hope wow. to act. It's incredible. That's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, OK, how about uh, Sanjeev, solutions? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, thank you for this invitation to come here. And congratulations on this fellowship program. In fact. I want to also recognize, I think there are a few people in this room, the Helmsley Trust, uh, the, the success of ECHO in this world, the Helmsley Trust has played a big role, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that both support you. And there's a man in the audience, Stuart Portman, who is the health policy advisor for the Senate Finance Committee in the United States Senate, who I call the founder of the ECHO Act of 2016, <laughs> and got 97-0 in the US Senate because of his strategic leadership and the House unanimously, and then he got President Obama to sign it into law. Yeah. And now he's helping us with the ECHO Act of 2019. Yeah. So thank you all yeah. for this. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to the solution, so you know, I had seen this patient who had passed away, but the problem was much bigger. There were 28,000 patients who had been diagnosed in New Mexico with hepatitis C. This is a reportable disease. We knew their names, but only 1,500 had been treated. They were trying to come to see me. They couldn't get there, and uh, many people were dying, and I thought, okay, I have to figure out a way to bring access to treatment for everyone, and then I would have a model for complex disease yeah. in rural locations in developing countries. So in 2003, I launched ECHO based on four key ideas. One is to use technology to leverage expertise. And the technology was one to many video conferencing, and the expertise was a psychiatrist, a pharmacist, and a liver specialist. The second key principle was sharing best practices. So I had my protocol in my clinic that I used. And what I did was I set up 21 new centers of excellence for treating hepatitis C in New Mexico, 16 in rural areas and five in prisons, each run by a primary care clinician. So I gave them my protocol, but not a single one of them was willing to give this chemotherapy of weekly injections in the prison or rural area. So I, that brought us to the third principle. So I asked myself, and I did my fellowship in Boston, how did I become an expert? So I would see a patient present to my professor, see another one to my professor, I kept doing it for two years, and they started calling me a gastroenterologist. I said, aha, I'm going to use this model to create new hepatitis Cologists in New Mexico, <laughs> brand new ones. And we call this iterative guided practice or case-based learning. And the fourth principle is tracking outcomes on the internet. So I started this teleecho clinic in 2003. All 21 would join together. One by one presents de-identified patients to each other and to our team. And what we found was in a year, they became great experts. The wait in my clinic in 18 months went down to two weeks. And we started doing research showing that their joy of work increased, their professional satisfaction went up, efficacy went up, isolation went down. And then we published in the New England Journal that they could produce, the, give chemo in a prison or rural area at the same effectiveness. Once we showed that, we then expanded it to 40 separate networks in New Mexico, but we want to help a billion people, so we started training other universities all over the world. 
uh, developed a digital infrastructure for it, which we give away to everyone for free. And every one of you is, is welcome to use it uh, if you reach out to us. And now we operate in 35 countries with hubs and 50 thousands or so clinicians and other people participate on our networks for 70 different uh, networks in healthcare. We have about 20 networks in education. We have, um, and so on and yeah. so forth. So that, that, is, that is really a, a way of building scale by creating networks and leveraging technology um, and information. It's, it's incredible. Yes, we, all our days are spent finding innovators like you and you. And we go to them and say, hey, you're doing something amazing. You figured out some amazing solutions. Yeah. Can we give you echo so you can amplify your impact a hundredfold, we call that force multiplication. Exactly. Exponential improvement of capacity to deliver best practice solutions. That's our fundamental reason for existence. Okay, so on the theme of force multiplication, if we multiply your force, it's gonna be a big bang. You have so much force. <laughs> so tell me about your work. What are the solutions uh, that, you, that you've moved into development? I think, uh, is this working? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, corruption has been a cancer for countries as mine. Um, and we are showing that with a $1 million uh, budget for a year, we are saving lives and we are doing amazing things. So we travel throughout half of the country uh, with three trucks, <laughs> our, our mobile units, um, and we put everything in there. So we can uh, make a clinic in a school, in a house, in a community center, wherever we can. And we provide um, a cervical cancer screening, IUDs, and hormonal implants. And with some um, friend hospitals, we do tubal ligations, vasectomies. Uh, and we try to really respect the culture. So we have um, four nurses um, in specific places that they work with a bag in, in their shoulders uh, and they carry everything and they provide services with cultural uh, respect. So for example, in the highlands in Solola and Totonicapan, it's 99% of the population indigenous. So we hired a beautiful Senaida, our nurse. Um, she's an amazing nurse that I supervise and uh, I train, supervise, do medical audit uh, because we really think that people should have the same uh, quality care than in the best hospital of Guatemala. So she uses uh, her indigenous clothes uh, to provide services, and this allowed uh, women to believe in her. Because if I'm uh, this whitey <laughs> girl come to the, uh, the, the, uh, the village and tell them, I have to give you something. I, I want to talk to you about something. They're not going to listen to me. Uh, but they listen to Zenaida. So we have discovered that um, respecting the cultural specific situations is the clue and providing uh, quality services. So we are only 40 uh, members. And uh, we have three programs, uh, a youth educational program that we, um, uh, we show uh, the, the youth uh, about sexual and reproductive um, uh, themes. Uh, at the end, we don't want them to, to have uh, a, pregnancy, a pregnancy. Um, we have uh, pro uh, voluntary promoters in 50 places of, of the country, and they provide um, short acting methods. Uh, some of them don't even know how to write, uh, but quarterly, we put them all together uh, and we train them uh, in specific health um, themes. Uh, and we have the, the community uh, services. So we do IUDs, hormonal implants, subal ligations, vasectomies, um, and uh, cervical cancer screening. At the end, in one year, we can serve uh, 25,000 uh, women and men with one million uh, budget. Um, so we're showing that the, uh, our country president and everybody in the Congress, uh, there's not enough money if everybody stalls it, steals it, thank you. Yeah. Um, but if we, you're careful with your resources, we can do a lot of things with very little resources. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I have a question, but I'm going to hold it because I, I want to let you get some questions in, and I'll come back maybe with one more. Um, so on the right, yes. Um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much for being here. Just a quick question. Uh, some of the other panelists have talked today about telemedicine being a big answer for rural situations to happen. I'd be curious. I didn't hear that uh, in your answers yet. Do you think that's hype or you think that's something real? Could you ask the question again? What was it? Te telemedicine. Okay, telemedicine. Thank you. Yeah, telemedicine? I can take that. I think that uh, telemedicine is an extraordinarily useful modality to overcome what we call a geographic divide. The patient is far away. The patient doesn't have to travel. You can put a specialist on one side, put the other person on a camera, and take care of him. What telemedicine does not do is capacity expansion. When I look at the world, there are six billion people in the world who don't get the right knowledge at the right place at the right time. There is an absolute sh shortage of specialists. That means if I take myself as a specialist in Albuquerque and put myself into a, on a camera to see a patient in rural New Mexico, I'm going to see one less patient in Albuquerque. And I have a long wait to see me in Albuquerque. So the, the net total number of patients seen in the world does not increase. Whereas in a tele-echo clinic, which is different from telemedicine, our purpose is different. In telemedicine, we give them fish. In tele-echo, we teach them how to fish so that we fundamentally increase capacity to deliver best practice 10 times first and then 100 times. And that's, that's the primary difference. Both can be very effective and complementary as long as you have enough specialists to deploy on a telemedicine framework. Uh, just. Uh an example, um, we have 13 nurses, uh, very basic, uh, the, their educational is very basic, so I trained them to do BIA, cervical cancer screening, and I do medical supervision and I do medical audit, but sometimes they're on the field alone and they don't know uh, what they're looking, so uh, they send me a WhatsApp, Michelle, can you please help me? They take a picture, send it, and I, I can say, oh, she needs a cryo, or you can refer for a colposcopy. That's, that's technology, too. That's telemedicine, too. Yeah, and just very briefly, um, a current issue that I'm hoping is not a long-standing issue is opioid addiction. Um, so ideally, we, we would be preventing, but telemedicine is incredibly useful and valuable for medication-assisted treatment when you do not have local mm -hmm. MAT-certified providers. So yeah. just as a quick... Thank you. Example. Next question? Right here. Thank you so much for, to this excellent panel. I'm Adeze Ore, one of the New Voices Fellows. And I'm from Nigeria. So Nigeria, our population is like 200 million. We have roughly 10,000 primary healthcare centers that are mostly due to corruption and due to many other factors, poor allocation of staffing, poor <coughs> resourcing in terms of med medication and equipment personnel. So you can see where there's a large population that doesn't have access to basic health care in effect. So my question would be, what would you think about the possibilities and the prospects of public-private partnerships in delivering care to mostly rural populations through basic primary health care? Thank you. Well, and I can take the, the first uh, stab at that. And actually, that's something that we need vitally. So from my perspective, with uh, working in tribal populations in Indian health service, that is more of a public sector arena. But we certainly don't have all the providers and specialists and types of services we need within the IHS. So we have to have partnerships with the private sector. So, for example, back to telemedicine, we do have a relationship with what's called Avera Health out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And they provide telemedicine to the entire Great Plains region. So it's a four-state region with 17 tribes. So that's just one example where we do need to have public-private partnerships and recognize that quite often in rural, impoverished communities, we don't have the resources to meet all the needs. So we definitely have a very strong partnership with, the, with your government. And uh, we run many ECHO projects in Nigeria. And we have brought our technology platform to your government, the Zoom platform, and our Project ECHO resource library in the cloud, where we share our intellectual property from all 35 countries and all the major universities with the government of Nigeria. And third, the primary use uh, that your government has chosen of ECHO in, in Nigeria is for HIV and TB control. And you may be aware of some of these programs. I see you nodding. And so that's an example of a private partnership. But my dream is 
uh, that uh, the Nigerian government will partner with us for a lot more than just HIV and TB, because this was funded mostly by USAID and PEPFAR, but I think we want to uh, track hard to treat hypertension, diabetes, and especially prevention of kidney disease, which as you know is a very major problem in your country. So I think that we are ready for uh, expansion of this private partnership with you. Thank you. Does, does WINGS have any private partners? Yeah, uh, actually we're very tiny and we have to be strategic. So we try to find these partnerships uh, to do promotion because uh, it's not worth it to come into a village and not having any women. Uh, so we have to work with other organizations and uh, uh, government, uh, the public sector. Uh, on all the surgeries, we do it in, in hospitals or, or health centers. So we have to have partnerships. Yep. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, straight ahead. Mr. Uh, Secretary Glickman, yes. Full disclosure, former agricultural sec secretary uh, and Longtime member of Congress and work, leader within the Aspen Institute, uh, Dan <laughs> uh, Well, first of all, Michelle, thanks for your work. I've been to Guatemala. I visited oh. some of the areas, and what you're doing is just spectacular. Yeah. But I would say two things. There's two recent incidents that really hit me. One is, is that this John Stewart incident, when he went before Congress and really berated them for not providing the funding for the 9-11 uh, problems that people were having. And then in, in the last year, the VA, the Veterans Administration, had all these problems. And people came by the hundreds, if not the thousands, to tell the Congress that the system was really a big failure. I guess my point is I'm really impressed by your stories. Stories are more important than statistics, to be honest with you. But the stories need to be told, especially in the United States, to policymakers so you build champions. A lot of people talk about rural health care. When push comes to shove, I don't know how many champions that you've got. Yeah. And it really means that you both and people like you have to be out there advocating like crazy for what you believe. Mm -hmm. You gotta make it a little bit uncomfortable for these public officials. Our system <laughs> allows for that. And I think what you're doing really can encourage that. Yep. So I just thought I'd mention that. I can't help following that up, but by asking Michelle, uh, because th there must be some pretty strong opposition to what you're doing. Because, just in my words, it's you're fundamentally challenging the power of the patriarchy. Yeah. Mm. Um, but we have some regions <laughs> where uh, uh, women are getting more powered, you know? Uh, and they say, okay, to their husband, but then the, the husband leaves. And they've been very powerful and <laughs> taking decisions. Yeah. yeah, especially in non-indigenous regions. You can see where, where my family is from, Sacapa. Women are like strong. Yeah. Um, in indigenous populations, uh, we have a lot of um, relationship with um, iglesias, uh, church, church, Catholic church and evangelical church. So it's a lot of... Um, more than the husband is the church or the la, leader of the community that decides for them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. More Thank than you. the husband. Yeah, and I would just say regarding advocacy, um, we do have National Indian Health Board, which is a, an important organization based in Washington, D.C. But for uh, tribes in the U.S., one of our biggest challenges is that we have federally recognized tribes in 35 states. So therefore, 15 states and 30% of the Senate has no tribes in their constituency. So what do they care about our issues? It's not gonna help them get reelected if they advocate for us. So the truth is we need partners in advocacy and that's something that we have been working on, trying to have other entities and even being here is meaningful because we're not always at the table in these discussions, but I agree 100%. And I was at Senate Committee on Indian Affairs just several weeks ago, but there's, there's not enough um, advocacy and support for indigenous health in the United States. It's remarkable. I, I work with uh, public health academics all over the country, and I always like to remind them that you do not have to cross an ocean to find third world health conditions. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's right here in our reservations. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Pam McGurgan, I'm family medicine and lifestyle medicine, actually working in a rural health clinic about 60 miles away from here. 
And so I have a little comment and a question. So we're projected to have a shortage of primary care physicians in America of about 30,000 in the next 10 years. And family medicine physicians are kind of the front line in our rural health communities. So two part question, how do we incentivize new medical students to actually choose primary care and to go into these rural health settings? And the second part is to how do we transform our healthcare system from a sick care system into something where we actually incentivize prevention and wellness care so we don't have our patients who are dying of liver cancer because of hepatitis C? So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. And, and so, so, being at a medical school, I'm, we deal with this all the time, and I'm a family physician myself. Um, so, we do have incentive programs that some of the rural communities help to support uh, uh, medical students. <laughs> Certainly through um, HRSA, the Health Resources Services Administration, there are uh, loan repayment programs and other types of funding mechanisms to support that. But even with all of that effort, we're still going to have this tremendous shortage. And I do agree that we also need more of a focus on preventive medicine. So one of our other projects is we're in process of trying to develop a rural and tribal-focused preventive medicine residency. There's preventive medicine residencies all over the country, but none with a rural and tribal focus. And when I think about what we could do with that, we could have preventive medicine physicians who are licensed physicians, but they could be providing MAT. They could also oversee home and community-based services. I think the, the promotora model, the community health worker model is underutilized, particularly in rural populations. I, I could envision preventive medicine doctors as the, the medical directors of home and community-based services. And then the policy side, that needs to be billable under Medicaid. Yes. Yep. So each of you is a leader. Um, and each of you is trained as a physician. You, and there's a kind of a relationship. I think it's sacred between a physician and the person who gives you her or his trust for care. And once you've given that care, you've received that trust, something is different. You could have done that your whole careers. But each of you chose to build on that to work at the level of structure, system, organization, in some cases, politics. Does your training and that relationship that you learned to value as a physician inform what you do now? You know, for, for me, you know, fundamentally, um, what I learned in my practice of medicine, which I did for couple of decades before I started ECHO was empathy. And at the end of the day, the root of ECHO is not the model, it's empathy. It's not a technique, it's not technology. It's fundamentally understanding how much suffering there is in the world even when the medicine is lying in the next room and it's not a financial problem and it's free. Let me give you an example. In India, 1,100 people die every single day of tuberculosis when the medicine is free and in every, village, every place you have a gene expert machine to do the TB diagnosis, but you don't know how to use it. So I think the issue for me was, can we use the technology platform to democratize empathy, to give primary care the support they need. Because when we talk to primary care clinicians and say, what happens? Why do you leave and then start working for industry? You know what they tell us? It wasn't just a lack of money. They were isolated. They felt unsupported. They were not able to create teams. They, they just felt that the mission for which they went into primary care, they're having a hard time fulfilling because the knowledge was exploding at an exponential pace. They couldn't keep up with it. So they left, they surrendered to it, and, and that's the problem we are trying to solve. But at the heart of equity is empathy. And that empathy being saying that there are people in this, all human beings have the same aspirations, they have the same hopes and dreams, and can we use what we've been given to help them? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for me? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Finding uh, a meaningful life was uh, the decision point. Uh, I used to have my clinic, my private clinic, and I did very well, a lot of money. Uh, but at the end of the day, I went to my house so 
empty and stressed. Uh, just to put an example, uh, with wings, we go to very, very, very poor places. And after the, the, the clinic day, they always have soup. They prepare soup. And maybe it's the only chicken they, they have that they raised and they, they, they have little uh, chickens. That's, that, that doesn't have a value. So if we use the word uh, trust, we're really trying to, to build um, trust with our donors, with, uh, between the team, uh, with the patients. So I think trust is like the, the word that we have to base our actions in this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and for me, working in advocacy, I did not learn that in medical school. Um, but I, I was fortunate to do a, a fellowship in minority health policy where I did get a master of public health as well and did acquire some skills there. But in truth, much of it is just learning how to operate in two worlds. As, as an indigenous person and deeply connected to culture, we have to learn not only a new language in, in the modern healthcare system, but even a, a completely different set of values and, and not losing track of who we are from a cultural perspective while still trying to thrive in a system that is in many ways foreign to us is a challenge. But I would say that was not learned in medical school. That, for me, that was learned in other um, settings with public health, but then also just working with communities and maintaining that connection culturally. Yeah, thank you, Don. So the Aspen Institute takes pride in building networks of values-driven leaders who want to make positive change. Um, not only are you the embodiment of that, but I'm so proud that you're part of this network. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you to our audience. <laughs>